So you want to put a new machine tool on your floor, but you may have never been through this before and may not know all the steps that go into it. Today, we're going to be covering new machine day and everything that happens before that day happens. What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool, back here again for Practical Machinist. And today we're gonna to be talking about all the steps that go into putting a machine on your floor. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Let's get into it. guys so as promised today we're gonna to be talking about what you need to do to buy prep for install and set up a new CNC machine tool it's something that I think a lot of people think about think about because you know people think about putting a new mill in their garage they want to buy a used mill and put it out in their shed maybe to start their own business or maybe you know they're looking to start their own shop or maybe they're looking to expand their shop and depending on what kind of setup you had prior to starting that shop or expanding that shop, you may have never actually gone through this process before. So I thought it'd be interesting to cover the whole process that goes into it. We just put a brand new mill turn machine on our floor. It just got here a couple weeks ago. We just kind of got it set up. It's actually going to start making chips today on the day of filming right now. And I think it's very surprising if you've never been through this whole scenario before just how much goes into buying a machine to put it bluntly you don't just pay the money and start making chips there's a lot that goes into it so hopefully this is interesting and hopefully informative to any of you guys who have not done this before so if the first thing you need to do when you want to go buy a new machine tool and this is after you've done all the homework to you know figure out the best machine for your needs and you know what you want once you've got that done, the first thing you need to do is find out who actually sells that machine in your area. Um, when it comes to machine tools, you know, lathes, mills, wire machines, um, laser cutters, whatever it may be, it functions a lot like the big automotive brands. For instance, if I want to go buy a Ford F-150 pickup truck, I don't just call up Ford headquarters and say, hey guys, I want to buy a Ford truck. They would probably say, <laughs> Why are you calling me? For machine tool vendors, it's a lot the same in that I need to go find a dealership, essentially, that goes and orders that truck from Ford as the point of contact for me. So I need to figure out who sells in my area. So if I wanna buy a Haas, I need to figure out who sells Haas. If I wanna find out who sells Mazak, I need to find out who sells Mazak. And these companies tend to kind of have umbrellas, these distributors or resellers, so you may have a company that only does Haas, or you may have a company that only does Mazak, but there are a lot of companies that may handle, you know, RoboDrill and Yazda at their place, and another place may be Herco and Matsura, for instance. So you may find either it's an independent, one brand only type setup, or you may find that they handle a lot of the importing and reselling or whatever it is. And that's okay too. So if you see that, believe me, you're not walking onto a used car a lot. Uh, a lot of brands handle, a lot of these reseller brands handle a lot of machine tool brands. And you know, it, it really depends in your area what that setup is gonna look like. But once you've figured out who to get in contact with, the next step is getting your machine quoted out. Now, to get your machine quoted out, you need to spec it out. And Again, to use the automotive analogy here, much like you could get a car with a sunroof, a hatchback, and a nice stereo system, the same kind of customization exists for machine tools. Very rarely are you just gonna buy a stock off-the-shelf machine. It exists, you can definitely buy floor models or pre-assembled machines, and again, if you're buying used, you are kind of buying what is there. But generally, when you're buying a new machine tool, like let's use a mill or a lathe, for instance, you're gonna choose the features you want and the features you don't want. So if I'm a small job shop and we don't do automation for whatever reason and we don't do aerospace, so I don't care about tight tolerance on this machine, I may say I want a mill that has no probing, no automatic door, and I don't want a fourth axis package. And you could get a machine spec'd out with those exact customizations. And because I'm deleting things perhaps off the 
stock version of this, it might be cheaper. That said, you need to be really careful when you're specking out your machine with a lot of these options, because while there are some options that you can add on later, so once the machine is installed, there are certain things that you can get added on after, like probing packages or uh, lots of uh, Wi-Fi cameras or lots of different things like that, you know, memory expansion. There are certain things that if you don't put on the machine when you are ordering it, they're either super expensive or impossible to add on later. For instance, if you want a lathe, but you don't get the subspindle, it may be impossible to add that subspindle onto that machine without sending that whole machine back to the factory if that's even remotely worth it later. Or let's say I'm not into automation now, so I say, no, do you know what? I don't want the automatic door package to automatically open the door for the robot to load a machine. That's fine. You may be able to get it added on later, but that may cost three, four, five times more than getting it done when it was originally getting built. So it's important to kind of think hard about what you might grow into with a machine because there's nothing worse than having a machine and regretting not getting things on it because you probably will never get them on it. And then you gotta wait till the next machine if that day ever comes. Uh, you know, you're not gonna be stuck with a boat anchor, but you may be stuck with something that in a year you've already outgrown. So it's worth thinking about. After you have specced out the machine, the vendor then will quote it out to you and then you start the third phase, which is financing. So if you are paying cash for a machine and that you are not financing it, typically you put down a deposit at time of order and then you gotta get all your ducks in a row to pay the rest of that money on delivery day. If you're doing financing, the deal may look a little different. You know, it may be a little more layered with 10% due at order, 5% over whatever it is. I, it's, it's really gonna depend on the machine vendor you go through, the credit company and so forth but you need to go through all the steps to get the actual ordering of that machine done and the financing. Once that's done, we're on to step four now. You need to prep your shop for it. And it starts out that if you, the first step is reorganize. Because if you have had a shop for any length of time, you know, this is not a new empty building that you can just plonk down machines wherever you want. You probably don't just have space sitting around waiting for a machine. Very rarely have I walked into a shop and just seen half the shop empty. Typically, we tend to fill the space that we have with you know stuff we use. So for us, when we were bringing in this new mill turn machine, we had to go and actually free up some space. And to do that, we had to first move the material racking that we had in that space in order to move the saw. So we had a couple of saws that we had to move you know, we have an Alumatech, uh, aluminum cutting saw and just a standard chop saw to move that. We had to move those saws in order to move the mills that were over there. We had some manual mills. So we had to move those to a new location and get those all set up. Once all that was done, we could actually look at reorganizing that unit that we're putting it in, aside from actually moving the big heavy stuff in order to free up space for the machine. And if it sounds like musical chairs, it really is. Um, you know, when it comes to this kind of stuff, you, as I've said in other videos, you can get very complacent with the way your shop is laid out. And sometimes your shop is going to be laid out badly for years if you're not paying attention to it. And with the unit that this machine was going into, that was definitely the case. We uh, used it as a material storage unit and, you know, saw unit, like it was a material prep area. We just kind of put skids in there, we have racking. Uh, it wasn't used well. So it was a good opportunity to be able to go and reorganize this stuff, but it took a long time. Uh, when we were doing this, we were still a functioning machine shop. You know, we didn't close the, close the doors, lock them, and do this for two days. We still had orders to get out. So we had a lot of guys doing this between, you know, cycle time or at the beginning of the day before we get started. So it took longer than you'd probably think just to get everything set up. Also to add on to that, is electricity. When you're dealing with anything, you know, bigger than a toaster for the most part in a machine shop, it's gonna either have to have a 220 outlet for something like a welder, or it's gonna be hardwired into the wall with a transformer. So not only do we have to move all this stuff, we need to get the electrician in to disconnect, we move the thing, and then go reconnect it after. So it really was fairly involved, you know, with figuring out where we're gonna put things, how do we get power here, and so forth. 
also to speak on electricity, the fifth thing we had to do was get a transformer in. So for these big machines, they use a ton of electricity. And like I said, you can't just plug them in the wall. In fact, you can't even just hardwire them straight into the power. You need a transformer to be able to get you the electrical service you need in order to run the machine. So we had a transformer ordered with our machine. We've ordered them with the machine before and we've ordered them outside of the machine before. In this case, we just ordered it with the machine. We wanted that to show up a week early so we could have our electrician in to come, you know, electrically connected. I don't know the term for it, wire it in. So that when the machine came, we could connect it straight in and we're ready to go. For whatever reason, our machine actually ended up showing up early. So, and that's a good thing. I mean, it was nice, but it did mean that we were setting up and connecting that transformer on the exact same day that the machine was arriving, which is not the scenario I prefer, but at the end of the day, I'm always happy to have something that we're paying for here sooner than later. So it was a good thing. So once the electrics were covered, the next thing we had to do was go, and this is number six in this whole scheme here, was look at air. So if you've never hooked up a machine or you've not actually worked in a shop before, CNC machines, in my experience, I don't know of any that don't use air, but in my head, every single CNC machine needs a reliable, powerful source of air to function. If you do not have a good air compressor and air system, your machines will not run, period. They need air to tool change. They need air to activate solenoids. They need air to do things that I probably don't even understand that happen under the hoods of these machines. If you do not have air, you do not have a functional machine. So that's great. We had pipes already out there where this uh, machine was going that we could plumb into. The problem was we had a bit of an older screw compressor and it was kind of at the max of its life. Not in terms of it was dying, but it was barely keeping up with the amount of machines that we had here and the amount of air that they draw. So we had to go and get a new compressor. New compressor is great. Uh, it is a screw compressor with a pressure tank. And we actually have an old compressor that's been here since God knows when, but we're using that as a pressure tank as well, which means that, you know, we're gonna have to turn on the compressor less. It's automatic, so it fills the tanks. And when it hits a certain PSI, it refills them. With two pressure tanks, it means it's gonna do that less often, which means we're gonna get better life out of that compressor and essentially save on our electricity bill because it's not gonna be running constantly. So we had to get that in and then we had to get the pipes prepped for the machine. So that's number six. Number seven is getting, number seven, I'm running out of fingers here, is actually getting the machine to your location. Now, if you're buying a new machine, this is typically either included or set up by the uh, dealer or machine tool manufacturer. If you're buying used and you need to get the machine to your shop, you may have to set this up yourself. Typically, you'll hire people who are either described as riggers or mater uh, material movers, machine movers, and they specialize in doing this. They will crate it up, they will you know, get it all ready for transport, they'll put it on the back of a big truck, They'll bring it to your shop. It's usually wrapped in some nice plastic to keep it protected. And then they usually come with a big heavy duty tow motor or forklift. Our forklift couldn't lift one of these things to get it physically in your shop. Now, machines are two things, if they're good. They are big and they are heavy. And yes, I know that there are lots of nice small machines there, but you could be dealing with a big machine and most of the time you want a machine that is heavy because that's going to give you better rigidity in your tools, um, better performance. You know, heavy is good when it comes to CNC machines. That said, heavy is also very difficult to move and then double that if the machine is also big. So we had the material movers, uh, material movers again, they're machine movers, come in and move it in for us. And they did a great job. Uh, the clearance was a bit dicey at times, but you know, we got that thing in without a single scratch on it. And they'll come with skates, which basically go under the machine to be able to move it around to where you want it. Once it's moved in, you're still not ready to go. The electrics need to get hooked up, the air needs to get hooked up. And then typically what happens is if you're buying a new machine, the machine dealer or service company in your area will have to come in and do what's called commissioning your machine. So we're on step eight now. Commissioning is when they come in and actually unpack the machine. So when these things are shipped, they usually have shipping spacers in them, they have brackets, 
the hold it together to keep things from getting damaged and shipping. And also, that machine needs a lot to be able to get going. Firstly, you typically have to level it. Um, they need to do all the boot up stuff on it. They may need to update the software. They may need to go in and use the setup modes on the machine to indicate certain things square to each other and make sure everything works. For smaller standard machines, this could take a day. For us, it took a day. For the really big tricked out machines, you could be talking a week or more of someone there full time actually getting this thing going. You know, if your machine is the size of a room, they're probably not gonna be able to indicate it in and get it going in a day. If you have a tiny little machine, yeah, it's a little bit faster. So now that that's done, we're on to step nine, which is we have to fill it up with coolant. We have to get tooling in. So you have to get, you know, typically, unless you're a huge shop with a tool crib, you may not have enough tooling, tool holders, um, all the stuff that actually makes the chips in the machine on the shelf to be able to tool up another machine. So we had to order in a new tooling package, get that all set up, and then now today, after all that, we are finally ready to start making chips. The other thing we had to do was go get a new NC post for our uh, master cam, because that's what we use as our cam software. We had to get a post, so when that cam software spits out our programs into NC files, it knows what kind of machine it is doing that for, it knows the capabilities of the machine, it knows how that machine reads code. And posts, you know, you, some people can write them themselves if they're really talented. I'm not that talented when it comes to that kind of stuff, so we just got a post done by our cam software provider. And then we can actually start making chips. So hopefully this has been informative to you guys. We're really excited to add this capability to our shop. It's uh, the first mill turn machine we've ever had. You know, hopefully it's going to cut down on the number of operations we need to do, you know, instead of taking something from the lathe to a mill to another operation in the mill, hopefully we can do a little more in the same machine. So it's a nice capability to add and I'm, uh, I'm very excited for it. And also it adds, you know, we have a larger bore on that spindle, more horsepower than our previous lathe. So hopefully it works out well for us. In any case, guys, I would like to know in the comments below what your experience has been putting new machines on the floor. What were some things you didn't expect? What was something you should have thought of before the machine got there? You know, did you get an option you shouldn't have? Maybe should you have gotten an option that you didn't? Let us know in the comments below because I'd love to hear it. And as always, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care.